Thank you, Susan, and uh, thank you, everybody. Yes, I, I'm going to talk about metabolomics a bit, but I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey. I will get to metabolomics. You might not seem that way at some point. Um, so as I'm sure you all know now, um, Cognition Therapeutics has been engaged in developing small molecule therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease. And while there are a number of different um, approaches that have been taken that focus on um, amyloid beta uh, from monomers to things that tar target fibrils, we've been focusing on A-beta oligomers. And Susan might elaborate a little bit more on some of these other approaches and, um, um, and their failures in the clinic. Uh, but we've been focusing on A-beta oligomers, which are the most toxic species of amyloid beta. Um, we've been, um, what we did is we targeted uh, phenotypic assays to look at uh, cellular effects of A-beta oligomers and screen for compounds that would um, counteract the, these uh, these cellular effects, and what we found are um, small molecules that would displace A-beta oligomers from their binding sites on neurons and block downstream effects. Uh, so I think you've probably seen this data before. Susan showed some of it earlier, but um, this shows um, some of the ways that we've looked at uh, uh, three different complementary methods that we've used to look at displacement of A-beta oligomers on the left, you could see some in vitro results from cultured neurons. Um, how does this work? Oh. OK. Uh, this is uh, in cultured neurons. And you see immunofluorescence of A-beta oligomers. Uh, and then when uh, CT1812, which is our compound that is in the clinic, is put on after the A-beta oligomers, you displace uh, a vast majority of the um, oligomers, and here you can see a saturation binding curve, uh, just A-beta alone, and then in the presence of CT1812, and you see the decrease in binding at all concentrations of oligomer. Uh, we also have looked in uh, tissue from Alzheimer's patients, so these are post-mortem brain samples. Uh, we looked in uh, tissue surrounding um, the um, dense core plaques and look at uh, immunofluorescence of um, a beta, and you can see uh, from this tissue when the frozen sections, when they're put in, uh, P thawed and put in PBS in vehicle or A beta, you can see a dose dependent decrease the amount of A beta bound to that uh, human brain tissue. And then um, I think you've, a lot of you have seen this data before. Um, this is an in vivo situation where we have, oh, th this work was the, the second panel was done in. Um, by um, Tara Spires Jones and Chris Henstridge uh, in Edinburgh. Um, the last panel, uh, th this panel here, is uh, in in vitro uh, mice, where uh, uh, working with John Cerrito and Carla Udi at Washington University, um, they, they've developed a what they call a microimmunoelectrode. This is a five micron carbon electrode that's coated with A11 antibody. You've heard a little bit about A11 antibody earlier. Uh, the antibody attracts A-beta oligomers to the electrode, and then an electric pulse oxidizes the tyrosine in the A-beta, and you can measure through like standard electrochemical methods uh, the uh, concentration of A-beta oligomers. In this panel in the blue, the electrode's placed in the hippocampus, so it's interrogating the interstitial fluid in the uh, hippocampus. Uh, a, a baseline is measured. Uh, the electrodes can measure concentration on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Uh, drug is administered to the animal at, at this, where this vertical line is, and then you can see an increase in the soluble A-beta oligomers uh, in the interstitial fluid. Uh, in drug-treated versus uh, the um, vehicle-treated animals, where you see this uh, maintenance of a very steady baseline. Uh, what's more, if we take this electrode and you stick it in the lateral ventricle and look at what's going on in the CSF after drug is given, you can see an in appearance of oligomers in the CSF. So we've shown you know, three different methods here, uh, in vitro, ex vivo, ex vivo, in, in vivo, of displacement of A-beta oligomers and what's more, you know, clearance out of the brain into the CSF.
So we know that um, there's a lot of literature showing that um, most of the toxic effects that happen in Alzheimer's disease are downstream of A-beta oligomer binding. One of those things is disappearance of um, synaptic spines. So this just shows more um, in vitro um, immunofluorescence here. Um, and here you see uh, this is a, a neurite uh, in, in culture that runs along uh, horizontally here. Uh, you see red is A-beta oligomers um, detected by immunofluorescence. The green is a um, synaptic marker, um, synaptophysin. So you can see in this case when A-beta oligomers are added, you see a lot of oligomer bound and very low number of synapses. When the uh, CT1812 is added, in this case it was for 24 hours after the A-beta, uh, you see very little A-beta binding and you see a large increase in the, the number of synapses. And then um, downstream from that, uh, We've done behavioral studies in transgenic animals uh, and done a number of different um, behavioral uh, memory tests, so fear conditioning and uh, Morris water maze. And you can see here in uh, APPs, uh, so these are mice with uh, human APP with a Swedish London mutation. You can see the deficit in both assays and the red bars. Um, in the transgenic animals, and that's restored to normal uh, when um, those animals are given 10 mg per kg of CT1812 a day, once a day. Uh, in this case, it was um, for nine to 10 weeks. Uh, and more importantly, uh, it's important to notice, we, we've also looked at um, the, the wild type animals um, with the drug, and you can see in the last bar, there's no change in their performance. On, in, in, uh, in these behavioral tests, showing that we have a very um, specific mechanism that is targeting A-beta um, related deficits. It's not a, a general effect on um, cognitive ability. So of course, the reason why we're here, the reason we've brought you all here together is that our compounds, um, our sigma-2 ligands, um, this shows some data that we published in 2014 working with Bob Mack and Jinbin, um, and they showed very nicely here. This is um, human uh, brain tissue um, autoradiography with um, um, sigma-2 ligand. You can see th th this, these were actually two early analogs um, in our compound series. You can see dose-dependent inhibition of um, the um, displacement of the sigma-2 ligand. And then this is our CT1812 here. Um, in this case, this is in human jerkat cells, and you can see the uh, displacement um, of DTG with a binding affinity of about uh, eight and a half nanomolar. So we've repeated uh, in vitro binding in a number of different systems, uh, PC12 cells, rat liver membranes, and um, human TMEM97 cloned into HEK cells, and we always see this you know, single-digit nanomolar affinity uh, pretty consistently. Um, so the other part of the story here today is PGRMC1, and this again is, is work that we published several years ago where um, we knocked down um, PGRMC1 in our cultured cells with siRNA, and here um, in panel A you can see the binding of the A-beta oligomers uh, in um, cells treated with the siRNA, um, you can see uh, a, a drastic knockdown in the oligomer binding uh, compared to non-targeting siRNA in panel C. And we actually saw a nice correlation between the um, amount that we were able to knock down the uh, PGRMC1 and the amount of binding. And interestingly, it turned out that um, the most we ever could get was about a 30% knockdown of PGRMC1, and that seemed to eliminate 90% of the binding. So there seems to be a very tight coupling between the amount of PGRMC1 there and the um, uh, binding of, um, um, of oligomers to the, to the uh, cells. So of course, the, one of the big questions we had are, are, are these two proteins that are involved in the sigma-2 receptor, are they actually where they need to be in order to be mediating this effect on um, A-beta binding. Uh, we knew from our previously published work, this is, again, this is a, a neurite along here, and you see um, 
labeling of synaptophysin and A-beta oligomers. This is actually a pretty short-term incubation where you wouldn't see down regulation. And you can see some of the yellowish um, uh, overlap between the A-beta binding with um, synaptophysin. Um, so we've labeled cells with antibodies for TMEM97 and PGRMC1. So these are, um, you, you can see, uh, well here you can see a, a composite image of um, uh, MAP2 labeling and the PGRMC1, or the TMEM97 is expressed at high levels in the soma and also out in, um, along neurites in, in lower levels, pretty uh, you know, diffusely throughout the soma, uh, throughout the neurites. Uh, PGRMC1, we, we previously looked at also, and we could see a similar pattern. It's pretty bright in the soma and then out along the neurites. Um, in the system we're looking at, it's really hard to see any kind of um, punctate labeling uh, here. It's just, it's, it's pretty faint labeling. Um, so we've gone to um, other methods, um, which you've heard a little bit about today also, so proximity ligation uh, assay. Uh, which um, Aladdin was very um, nice to uh, give us some, some tips on. Uh, so here you see in our cultured um, neurons, uh, this is looking at a uh, PLA interaction between TMEM97 and PGRMC1. So what you see in the top are MAP2 labeling, or it's even the, the, the um, nuclei and MAP2 labeling and then labeling of synapses. In this case, we use synaptotagmin one. It just gave us a nice, uh, a little bit crisper labeling. And then the PLA reaction. And, and you'll notice you can see um, the um, PLA labeling that runs along the course of, of the neurites here. You, you see a lot of other things here. Uh, there, it's, it's, in these cultures, there's a very fine network of um, um, you know, extensions of, 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 of neurites uh, that don't necessarily show up in the MAP2 staining because they're so faint unless you really overexpose the image, but the, they're still running in lanes here. And then if you look at an overlap, uh, or you look at, you know, compare where the PLA interaction and the synapses are, you can see a uh, very remarkable overlap in the labeling. So um, it's about an 80% overlap. Um, Although we do see some instances of um, both um, PLA interactions that don't have associated synaptic markers and the opposite where we see some synaptic markers where there's in PLA. And we don't really know if that's an absence or just uh, below our detection limit here. We're not doing a very high um, resolution type work like, like you heard earlier by uh, Marty Colomb, but that would be... Um, um, they, 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 it would be very good to see what they're, they're seeing with their um, array tomography uh, with co-localization. So this is, this is work that was done by um, Kelsey Sadlick in our lab, um, and I just want to advertise her poster on Saturday, Sunday afternoon, so please uh, stop by and, and talk to Kelsey and see some more details about this work. Um, so really what... Oh. So what we've seen are, you know, the, the, the receptors for our drug um, are located in the location where A-beta ligamers are binding and where we see the drug act to um, release the oligomers. So what do we think is going on? So this is, a, you know, just a schematic of... Um, um, what we think is going on. So in, in up here you see a synapse and you see you know, presynaptic area and, and postsynaptically, that's where we believe the action is going on with a beta binding. Um, we haven't really localized these to postsynaptic um, post um, membranes. We don't have the resolution with what we're doing right now to see that. But uh, if you look at what's in there, um, there's a A-beta binding site, which you know, some very good work reviewed recently by Steve Stripmotter um, has um, identified you know, three proteins that are pretty, um, there's very strong evidence for being binding sites. So uh, LRB2, 
which is also known as peer B in uh, rodents, um, no-go receptor 1, and uh, the cellular prion protein. There are probably other things involved here too. Maybe LDL receptors are, are part of it. Um, be very interesting to um, you know continue exploring that. Then we have this receptor complex, uh, Team M97, PGRMC1, which interact with each other. And you notice we've also left a little box here, a little mystery box here, for the allowing for the possibility that there's yet another protein that might be involved um, with um, these two proteins. That uh, not that we have any evidence for such a thing, but. Um, um, you never know what um, the future holds in store for you. So this is you know, the situation normally. These proteins are floating in, in the membrane. Um, and in Alzheimer's disease, you get an accumulation of A-beta ligamers. They come in and they bind to um, some receptor complex. And um, our hypothesis is that this you know, PGRMC1, Team M97, Sigma-2 receptor is interacting with that binding site and stabilizing um, that oligomer binding site. Um, there's, I think you've seen a, a few bits of evidence here today that um, in Alzheimer's disease, the Sigma-2 proteins accumulate um, or, or, or seem to go to increase. We, we had published some data previously um, um, suggestive of that. And uh, I think one possibility is, you know, this proteins, they, they have normal turnovers, but if they're stabilized in a receptor complex with, complex with A-beta oligomers, then perhaps they're getting kind of stuck at the membrane and they're not getting turned over like they normally would. That could be part of an accumulation here. Um, but then when you add uh, um, sigma-2 ligand, like CT1812, ooh, the two jumped down there, um, you're altering the, um, the um, conformation of this receptor complex, which is um, kind of breaking its um, association with this binding site, and now it's no longer stabilized into a, a, a complex, and the oligomer comes off. Um, and then downstream of whatever's going on um, um, gets uh, turned off. So. I said earlier, we know that many of the pathological effects in AD have been shown to be downstream of A-beta oligomer binding. And um, well, I, I wrote here, the question arises, that's a rather passive way of putting it, so I'll more assertively say, I am raising the question that uh, how many of these pathological downstream effects are due to sequestering or locking up PGRMC1 and TMM97 into some complex? So, We've heard a lot of evidence about a lot of biochemical pathways that these proteins are involved with. Uh, so they have normal functions that they should be doing in, in, a, in a normal state. And in Alzheimer's disease, if they're being locked up and kept away from doing their normal work, um, is that causing some of the effects? And then uh, the next question is, can these abnormalities be um, relieved by um, putting in a drug that um, that restores things back to their normal state. Um, this is a slide that uh, I borrowed from Mike Cahill, Cahill's talk from last year, and uh, he's going to talk in more detail about this, I'm sure. But it just shows a lot of the places where um, you know, PGRMC1 is involved, particularly in cholesterol and lipid metabolism. So, uh, you, you can look at Mike's paper where he uh, talks about all these mechanisms, but you can see that there's a lot of different work, and Mike's done an enormous amount of work on um, you know, reviewing this literature and coming up with some very um, beautiful hypotheses about an overall um, uh, regulatory system here. Uh, besides PGRMC1, we know that Team M97 affects uh, lysosomal um, lipid storage and cholesterol transport. We've seen um, um, Aladdin's work on cholesterol uptake. So there are a lot of places where um, these proteins are involved in um, lipid chemistry, uh, cholesterol um, chemistry, and um, you know a lot of places where these things can be disturbed in Alzheimer's disease. 
So it happens that this has been looked at. So this is a paper published a couple of years ago, um, um, Toledo et al. And this, so this, whoops, sorry. This is uh, Rima Kadora Doak's um, group down at Duke, and she was really one of the foundational people in the study of metabolomics. So um, in this paper, there's some, some, you know, nice thing is here. So they, they say like, you know, complex disease such as AD arise from alterations in multiple genes, proteins, and metabolites. So there are wide ranging um, effects that are uh, being altered by um, the disease pathway. Uh, and we know that a lot of the metabolites, um, a lot of metabolites in general, are interrelated with each other in a number of different ways through pathways and cofactors and intermediates. Um, so they did this study uh, of 905 patients um, from the ADNI-1 cohort. Um, so this cohort, there's this vast amount of data on um, cognitive changes, imaging changes, and uh, biomarkers. And they did a, a, a metabolomic study um, um, using um, a kit from a company called Biocrates um, that um, can measure, um, it's called the P80 kit, but actually measures 188 metabolites. Uh, so there's just a little bit about that kit. So it uses a, an extraction process um, and then um, uh, mass spec, double mass spec, um, uh, method for measuring a um, number of different categories of um, metabolites. So you can see the interesting ones here. There are acyl carnitines that are involved in energy metabolism and fatty acid transport, uh, amino acids that are involved in a lot of different um, things, um, um, hexoses and carbohydrate metabolism, phosphatidylcholines, lysophosphatidyl. Uh, Colines um, and sphingomyelines. The the later two are are particularly involved um, with um, neuronal damage because they're, they're phospholipid uh, phosphomembranes are such an integral part of um, normal neuronal functioning. Um, so all this data is available through the Agni Consortium, in addition to the stuff that they published about. Um, so it'd be interesting to look. We thought it would be interesting to look at that type of thing. So we happen to have some samples from clinical trials that we're doing. So um, I think it was Susan mentioned earlier. We're, we're now in phase two studies of CT eighteen twelve. Um, the first two trials that have been completed. One was a phase one clinical safety trial, and that was published um, the beginning of this year. And then our second study was a. a, a a safety trial in mild to moderate AD patients compared to the, the first study was in uh, healthy normal patients. Um, so this study was a 28 day um, um, blinded study, double blinded um, placebo controlled study, 19 participants with mild to moderate AD. Um, they were treated once a day with uh, placebo or three different doses of drug um, for 28 days. Uh, so there were a number of you know, safety measures that were made along the way and pharmacokinetic measurements. But we also collected uh, biomarkers at screening uh, from plasma and um, from uh, CSF. Uh, so at the screening before the study and then at the end of the study. And I'm going to tell you about some of the measurements we made from the plasma samples. And Susan's going to tell you some of the stuff that was uh, done from the CSF samples. Um, so looking at our patient samples, uh, what we found when we compared all the treated patients together versus placebo controlled, we saw that there were 11 metabolites that were significantly increased in the uh, drug treated patients. Um, now, I should point out that none of these were significant by uh, when you correct for multiple comparisons. This was a pretty small test. Uh, uh, it was a pretty short duration. Um, Yet, what we see is this remarkable pattern um, in that um, if you compare the results in um, this study with what was published in Toledo et al., you see that uh, in, in the drug-treated patients, 10 of the 11 metabolites were actually moving in a direction opposite of the way they move in Alzheimer's disease. So it looks like they're moving a lot of these metabolites in a therapeutic direction compared to how they're changing in Alzheimer's disease. 
another way to look at the data is if you look at the um, metabolites that uh, Toledo saw um, significantly change, and that's in the, in the red there, uh, they found 18 metabolites overall that were significantly altered in Alzheimer's. You can see some of them are pretty small changes, but they tend to be tightly regulated, so they were um, statistically significant. And then if we looked at what happened in our study with those same metabolites, we see 12 of those 18 metabolites moving in an opposite direction than they were changing in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, now, if we look at particular classes of metabolites, um, one um, set of metabolites that looked pretty interesting um, were um, long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. So there have been a couple of studies um, that bring these um, metabolites to, um, uh, that sh show them to be of interest. Um, and I should say, another thing about our study is that the, the Toledo paper, all the patients that were looked at were um, fasted overnight before um, samples were taken. In our study, there was no control over that. So that can lead to a lot of variability. And, um, but um, um, one of the things we looked at was, well, okay, if we normalize the long-chain polyunsaturated facets to the total phosphatidylcholine pool, that could normalize some of the changes. So the reason we were interested in this was that uh, so long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids have been shown to decrease in plasma of AD brains compared to cognitively normal people. Um, um, like I said we normalized the uh, phosphatidylcholines, and what you see is that the um, while the total amount of phosphatidylcholines doesn't doesn't change, it's not actually shown here, but um, we can see an increase in the long chain um, polyunsaturated acid pool um, in treated versus normal. So again, um, you see a change, a decrease in, in these in um, AD and um, a reversal of that in the treated patients. Um, another category that we looked at was um, carnitines and acyl carnitines. So um, carnitines are, have an important role in um, acetylcholine synthesis, um, a critical role in, in cholinergic uh, neurotransmission. Uh, they've been shown carnitine and methionine, which is part of the carnitine cycle, uh, are significantly reduced in AD patients, serum compared to controls. Um, and then, uh, you know, going back 20, 25 years, there are actually a couple of clinical trials where, um, in an effort to try and boost cholinergic transmission, um, acetyl L carnitine was uh, tested in a clinical trial. Uh, so there was one study, it was a year long study, um, and they saw a benefit in a subset of mild AD patients. Uh, and then there was a follow up study um, where, um, in early onset patients um, that completed the trial, they saw some benefit there. So nothing further has been done with that, but uh, it was interesting. So in our samples, what we saw in the placebo patients, we saw a decrease over time in the acetyl, uh, this is um, the acetyl and acetyl, yeah, acetyl carnitine. Um, so a decrease in the placebo patients, but in the drug treated patients, we didn't see any uh, difference. And that was, um, you know, statistically different uh, between those two groups. So uh, in summary, um, CT1812 is a sigma-2 pgrmc one antagonist, which displaces A-beta ligamers um, from the synaptic binding sites. Um, we've shown that the proteins are in synaptic spines, in cultured neurons, where uh, the A-beta binds and, and uh, where the drug can act to displace the A-beta ligamers. Uh, we've seen evidence in plasma for mild to moderate AD patients that CT1812 can show a pattern of metabolic changes that oppose the direction that these metabolites have uh, during AD disease progression. And we think that this small trial uh, you know, warrants further examination in, in a larger cohort in, in future studies that are, are um, set to commence where we will be taking um, um, 
you know, samples for analysis. So I just want to acknowledge um, a lot of people that have uh, helped us along, uh, people in our lab, um, a lot of whom are here today, our medical and scientific advisory boards, our academic collaborators, many of whom I've named, and of course, um, we've uh, been the recipient of um, some very nice uh, funding from the National Institute of Aging um, and the Alzheimer's Disease, uh, Drug Discovery uh, Foundation. And of course, the patients and their families who are taking part in our studies. So I just want to, again, one more time, we, we have some posters in the, in the Sunday afternoon session. We hope to see you then and talk a little bit.